entering the free speech zone. Here's your host, Eric Barnard. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Free Speech Zone. I am your host, Eric Barnard. We're coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, on theconstitutevoice.com. I want to thank everyone that's made this podcast popular today, and I thank all of you for joining and tuning in. we got a very special guest for us today. I'm proud to be joined by the former pilot of Air Force One, Colonel Mark Tillman. Colonel, welcome to the Free Speech Zone. Thank you for doing this. Good seeing you. Thank you. Good to see you. So, um, everybody, Colonel Tillman has taken some time. He's been down in Atlanta speaking to a group. You've taken time out of your very busy schedule to spend... uh, about a half hour with us, so we're going to try to cover as much ground as we can. Uh, first question, um, when did you join the Air Force and why did you opt to become a pilot? Uh, I started out in ROTC out of Tulane University and graduated in 1979. And my first job with the Air Force was a rocket propulsion engineer. So I spent a couple of years at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio designing rocket engines and then uh, got the flying bug. So I uh, uh, applied for pilot training and was accepted and went to pilot training and uh, flew C-130s, flew the T-37 uh, as an instructor pilot and then applied to the 89th Airlift Wing at Andrews Air Force Base to fly the VIPs uh, back in 1989, actually. Wow, so you come in uh, 1989, so right there at the beginning of the first uh, Bush administration. Um, so uh, what did, uh, when you first arrived at Andrews and you arrived to fly the VIPs, what were you, first, what were you doing before you stepped up to the uh, Air Force One? I started out as a Gulfstream 3 pilot, so I was in the 99th Airlift Squadron flying the Gulfstream 3, and we we flew a lot of the senators, congressmen, vice president, and then uh, eventually I uh, got a chance to fly with Air Force One as a co-pilot, and uh, then I was honored to have been selected as an augmentee back in the uh, early 90s under President H.W. Bush, and then stayed with Air Force One for the next 16 years. 16 years. Yep. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, how many years as a co-pilot? Started out for a couple years as a co-pilot under President H.W. Bush, and then uh, flew uh, President Clinton's administration as a portion of it as the deputy presidential pilot. And then was truly honored to have been selected as President Bush's pilot uh, when he came into office. Incredible. Uh, what uh, What's the criteria for a, uh, for a pilot to step up to Air Force One? It's a big responsibility. You know, we look at all the pilots in the 89th Airlift Wing, and, you know, there's probably 100 pilots, and then uh, there's only about eight pilots at Air Force One. So we, we take a look at the best of the best and bring them on over to Air Force One, then train them, and then slowly you work your way up as people retire. And, uh, and it was the same thing in my case. So I started out as a young co-pilot in the 747, got taught by uh, presidential pilot uh, number 10, Danny Barr, then on to presidential pilot 11, Mark Donnelly, and then eventually selected as presidential pilot number 12 for President Bush. Wow, that's uh, that's incredible. Uh, when did you, uh, what was your first official day as the uh, 12th pilot? I took over in the summer, I think it was in June of 2001. Uh, Mark Donnelly retired at that point as President Clinton's pilot, and then he flew the first six months of President Bush's administration. And then I took over at that point uh, and then stayed with the Bush administration until the president moved on in the uh, the winter of 2009, January, February, after the inauguration. Wow. Um, when, you were, uh, when you were tasked to become the uh, pilot and you're flying a large 747, you were started off you know, flying C-130s, Gulf Streams. Uh, how, was hand, how was flying a 747 for you? You know, 747 is an amazing aircraft, you know, tremendous redundancy, nice and smooth aircraft, and it goes very fast, you know, 9-2, 9-3 Mach, and it uh, moves right along. It's it's kind of like a giant football field in the air. It's just, <laughs> it's incredibly uh, smooth and comfortable to fly, you know, tremendous legacy with the 747. So it, for me, it was a true honor, but it was a, it was a pilot. It was, uh, it was kind of a big sports car. Very nice plane. <laughs> that's what, that's wonderful. Um, I guess I've heard people say 747, they wouldn't classify it as their favorite aircraft to fly uh, because it is so large and so heavy. Um, when you are uh, when you go and you uh, take over as the head of being the presidential pilot, there's more to just being the pilot Air Force One than just simply manning an aircraft and flying from point A to point B. Uh, tell us about the duties of being the uh, the pilot because you're also the commander of the squadron. 
Absolutely. You're the, in our case, you're the commander of the, the group, the United States Air Force Group. And not only that, you were a director down at the White House. So the White House has a military function as well, the White House military office. So you're a director there with Marine One, you know, the Camp David folks, the mess folks. Uh, you know, the Army's got a contingent that provides transportation. So the, there's a lot of folks involved in the White House that people don't understand. So uh, that, that was the my job as well, working with the White House. House. Uh, you know, the Air Force job, you know, you, you've got 250 of the finest, best of the best personnel in the United States Air Force and contractors as well. So it's, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call it a tough job because when you got <laughs> people around you that are highly motivated and the best of the best, it's a, uh, you know, it's just an idea of bringing people together, let them know what's going on and uh, no one ever fails you. I mean, you just don't fail at Air Force One. You don't have that luxury of you know, learning from your mistakes. You got to make sure you don't make a mistake. And, you know, if you make a mistake, then you're taken away from the president's message. So you make sure you don't make mistakes. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It's a, it's a no fail mission. Absolutely. And, uh, but there's a lot of pieces to it and they, uh, they all have to bat a thousand uh, every absolutely. day. Uh, when you when you uh, take over and you're being the commander for this, um, what did you uh, what did you think uh, when you uh, you finally say, "Wow, I'm going to be the pilot of this aircraft"? What, what, were you, what was going through your mind? You know, I, I was lucky enough to have gone all through eight years of President Clinton's administration, so I was very familiar with the mission was, what the job was, sure. and I'd seen other commanders uh, take over Air Force One. So, you know, they, the the leaders ahead of me were exceptional leaders. So I, you know, I just following in their footsteps, that's exactly what I did. You know, there wasn't reason to change a lot of things. However, after September 11th occurred, we had to change quite a few things uh, security wise and everything else. So it it became more of a, a job as opposed to what it was previously. But, you know, it's like I always say, you know, the team, the team came together and the team made it happen. And, uh, you know, the Air Force uh, provided superior leadership leadership to us and made us made us all fit right into what the uh, the new threat levels were and Air Force One yeah, yeah, as you know you get your sport in the president so it's uh, the security is always top-notch and you can't ever let it down no absolutely not uh, let's uh, let's move to uh, to 9-11 uh, you uh, became a uh, official pilot you were selected uh, you started in the summer you said uh, around June so three so uh, four months and uh, the uh, biggest terrorist attack in American history September 11th happens uh, first uh, tell me ab about that day uh, you uh, fly to Florida with the president and uh, when did you first learn of the attack? You know, we, we went on September 10th, we went to Florida for an education visit. Then the next morning, September 11th, uh, we all rally up at the plane like we always do to fly back to Washington, D.C. And then uh, slowly we started learning of the attack because it was on television. Uh, the command and control for the Air Force as well as the White House, they assumed the first attack on the towers was just a aircraft accident and everybody thought the same thing. It wasn't until the second aircraft hit the tower that it became very obvious that it was an attack on the U.S. Um, and at that point, we started moving into action, getting the plane ready to uh, bring the president back to Washington, D.C., or in the case we assumed was we were going to have to bring the president to some location to let him hunker down for continuity of government, to make sure that the president's secure, vice president's secure, speaker of the House, et cetera. Absolutely. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the line of succession has to be protected at all times, and right. especially in a drastic period like September 11th. Uh, um, I remember September 11th very well. I was, uh, I was 11 years old. I was in uh, sixth grade. Uh, I was in math class, and the uh, speaker came over, the loudspeaker came on and said, all teachers turn, your ch turn the television on, and we saw the uh, attack unfolding. Uh, when uh, President Bush uh, arrived to the aircraft, um, obviously I'm sure he wanted to go directly back to Washington, but uh, in fact uh, you, you didn't go directly back to Washington. You actually uh, kept him in the air for a while. Uh, why, uh, why not fly directly back? You know, we, we turned out of Sarasota heading direct to Washington, D.C., and then as we were heading to Washington, D.C., the last aircraft, uh, the one that had hit the Pentagon, that attack occurred before the president got on the aircraft. And the last aircraft was over Shenandoah Valley, or actually the Ohio Valley, and it made its turn towards Washington, D.C. So at that point, it became obvious that we didn't want to hit Washington, D.C. about the same time as the potential aircraft that was, uh, or, you know, the hijacked aircraft was heading towards Washington, D.C. So we turned away to loiter until we were positive what it was going to happen with that 
aircraft. And, and uh, how long could you have kept the president uh, in the air like that? I mean, a large, a large jet uh, like this, you, I'm sure you can be in the air for many hours, but uh, obviously at some point you have to refuel. Uh, on that day, we had about five hours worth of gas on board, and the plane can usually fly 13 to 14 hours, but planes are refuelable, so we had tankers available to us if we needed to air refuel, but it's just, you know, that's not really a, a, a common sense logic for us. It, you know, it's better to get them on the ground, better communications, safer on the ground than it is to keep them flying airborne around the United States uh, really? that whole period. So so that, that was also the philosophy of the president. He was not interested in staying airborne. He wanted to get to the ground, address the American public, because that was something we couldn't do on Air Force One at the time. No ability to stream video. There. Really? The, only, the only thing we had was he could talk to the American public. Tremendous communications, but mm -hmm. no video video as such. So we the satellite television wasn't a capability. We had tuners from the aircraft that would uh, terrestrial base, so it was ground base. So the tuners would hit basically the uh, three major news networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, no cable television at all. So, wow. so the, the challenge was he had to address the American public. So the decision was made to land at Barksdale Air Force Base. Which is in Louisiana. In Louisiana, and uh, have the president to, you know, talk with the nation, let them know what's going on. And as soon as that was accomplished, then it was time to move them, play the shell game, get them somewhere else. Sure. So not stay in any one location for a length of time. Mm -hmm. so. And when uh, you uh, land at Barksdale, uh, what what, after the president uh, left and went uh, went where he could address the public and I'm sure talk to the media, what uh, what were you doing exactly in the crew? What did you all remain with the aircraft? Did you uh, were you able to call home and talk to your family? I imagine you're, no, you were concerned. No, we I wouldn't let the any members of the crew call anywhere because it was we were kind of uh, hidden at that point. No one really knew where we were until they let it out. We were at Barksdale, so I didn't want the crew talking with their family. So we took a lot of the communications away from them. Okay. Um, the big thing we did in Barksdale still was tank the plane up because we didn't know how long we were going to be airborne. So we filled the plane up with gas. And then uh, after that, the president addressed the nation. Then he came back to us. Now the plan was to leapfrog over to Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Right. So another highly secure area. Put them deep underground so we can talk to the National Command Authority and, and get things rolling what he needs to. You know, tremendous communications, a safe environment, and kind of give us time to get the Washington, D.C. area, um, get it, you know, safe so we could come in and we knew where all the threats were and we could counter the threats coming in. Mm, incredible. Um, uh, you eventually do make your way uh, back to Washington, D.C., back to Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, when you flew over D.C., and could you see the Pentagon? Yeah, we came in. Standard arrival is uh, you come out over Dulles, then work your way in, come in over the top of Reagan, Washington Reagan, and then you go to Andrews Air Force Base, cross the river. So as we came in, you could see the Pentagon smoldering still. And wow. You could see the damage out the window. And it was tremendous. We, you know, we were following almost the same route as the airliner did when it attacked the Pentagon. And you really? Could see the, you could actually see the damage on the side of the Pentagon. And you know, it was the first time the president and all of us actually saw actual damage. You know, we'd wow. seen a lot of things on TV all day long but you know it, it just really hit home at that point absolutely and then landed Andrews Air Force Base president addressed the nation that evening and then days later we brought him up to uh, ground zero uh, mm -hmm. took the plane up to uh, McGuire Air Force Base and then he helicoptered into the Wall Street landing zone so he could go to ground zero Wow Wow 9-11 um, uh, changed so many things the, the every american's life was affected in some in some fashion uh obviously uh you said the mission was changed for you specifically and everyone at the uh, president's airlift group uh what exactly uh what exactly were the big changes that you had to implement you know prior to september 11th uh, we trusted a lot of people so you know simple things like i could uh, the flight attendants could order 100 chickens from you know, a vendor, and they could deliver chickens to us with no problem. We didn't think anything of it. You know, right. we trusted all the vendors or whatever. But after September 11th, we took a good look at everything we're doing, mm -hmm. and you know, where were we going to fail the president? You know, where was security the lowest? And you know, that's that's an issue. You could actually got to make sure the you know, the vendors at this point were not vetted. So we so at this point we changed everything. So food service, all that was flight attendants took care of it, and they knew the source of the food. They knew where their food was coming from. Et 
etc. Sure. So that that's significant. Uh, security forces, everyone, uh, you know, not the bigger guns, but guns more designed to stop uh, incoming capability, not only people, but trucks, etc. You know, expand the perimeter, make sure the plane is highly protected at all times. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing was awareness. Uh, most of the crew, uh, you know, when they pack their bags and leaving the hotel, they wouldn't think anything of the fact that, you know, they, they may have lost sight of their bag for a little bit because they knew it was coming on a skier aircraft. Well, that all sure. changed. We made sure everybody knew that from the moment they packed their bag, they had to keep it in sight. And if they didn't, they'd have to fess up to it and we'd reopen their bag. Then we started bomb sweeping the, the bags every time wow. before it came on the plane, et cetera. So, you know, it was, a, it was a whole new procedure. It was no different than what the country was going through with TSA Absolutely. and everybody else. So it's, uh, it, it was time to make all these changes. And, uh, and now, you know, at first it was painful, but you know, sure. then it became, you know, easy, easy going because you, part you of allowed life. extra time and it was part of life and the awareness was there, et cetera. So it worked perfect. That's good. That's good. Uh, um, the uh, securing securing this aircraft is a is a huge responsibility. When I got assigned to it, um, I was not a I was not a I did not fly with the aircraft every mission, but I was at the PAG. I was at the uh, hangar every day, uh, working uh, twelve hour shifts. Um, understood the Im immense responsibility that comes with protecting. You know not not simply an aircraft but the the aircraft that carries the most powerful man in the world um let's uh let's fast let's uh, move forward past 9-11 to 2003 um uh, thanksgiving uh you actually uh, had to pull off a uh pretty important cloak and dagger uh, mission, so to speak. Uh, you uh, actually took President Bush into uh, into Baghdad to uh, spend Thanksgiving with the troops. Uh, tell, tell us about that mission. Yeah, the president from day one wanted to go visit with the troops in the war zone, not only uh, Iraq, but Afghanistan. Afghanistan, we just couldn't make it happen. There were no secure airports to bring a plane into, et cetera. Um, when uh, Baghdad uh, became more secure as such, the green zone, 2003, the president said he was going to go have uh, Thanksgiving dinner with the troops. We had to come up with a plan of attack. Uh, very few people were involved. Initially, I think there was only five of us that knew about the mission. So, you know, I came up with an idea of how to make it happen with the 747s, kind of fool the world with uh, changing call signs, changing types of aircraft. And then uh, the navigator that worked with me, George Pavelko, same thing. George and I came up with a pretty decent scheme of how to get the plane in and out of uh, Baghdad without anybody knowing it. Um, the, the challenge though was, you know, you're, you're as a leader, you're not telling your crew, you're not telling anybody about it. Not because you didn't trust them, you know, because each person is a person you trusted, but as a whole, all you were afraid of was someone may make a comment to another and right. another, and eventually the whole mission would be have to be scrubbed. President Bush was adamant. If anybody finds out about this, we're going to go ahead and scrub the mission because we don't want to take a chance that we're going to endanger the lives of the servicemen and women in Baghdad. So as a result of that, no one knew about the trip uh, from the crew end except for three people on the crew. And then, you know, the chief of maintenance, the head flight attendant, the head security a guy named Will Chandler, mm -hmm. and then uh, the head engineer, because the plane had to be ready to go during that period. So they all got briefed in toward the end. And then to get the crew to the plane, we just did like we always do. I trusted them that they're going to come running when the pager goes off. And that's exactly what they did. They came to the plane and everything was set. Uh, briefed them in on the mission. And they executed perfectly. I never had any doubt they wouldn't. No, absolutely. Uh, they uh, they pulled uh, they pulled it off. Uh, going into an active war zone, uh, what was that? Uh, what was that like for you? Um, flying in there, uh, were you, were you scared? Were you nervous? Uh, because you're bringing in an air, an aircraft that uh, is painted blue and white with the American flag on the tail. That's a pretty big target. Yeah, we came in uh, under the cover of darkness. I mean, that was, you know, a lot of people didn't see it with the windows blacked out, all lights off on the aircraft, uh, you know, which is kind of standard ops for the military. But the biggest challenge was not only were we fooling the terrorists, we were fooling our own military. Our own military didn't know that the 747 was coming in. They knew an sure. aircraft was coming in. But all it would have taken is for us not to know the codes, not to do the right things, and have a fighter come up against us protecting our U.S. airspace in yeah. Iraq and recognize the 747 and then have it just get out immediately that the president's actually landing Baghdad. 
you know, the challenge for us was once he's on the ground in Baghdad, all the third country nationals, et cetera, on the ground there, mm -hmm. let the word out that, hey, it looks like Air Force One's on the ramp here. And so now we only have a matter of hours before we've got to get them in and get them out before people in the city start to rally and, mm -hmm. you know, start firing and firing for effect into the airfield. So, so we only spent about two to two and a half hours on the ground there wow. and then moved them out immediately just to get them out of there. Sure. Uh, wow. Only two whole hours. Definitely. <laughs> That's a that's serious time. Um, I want to I want to move on. I uh, when we made the announcement that you were appearing, we had a number of uh, viewers uh, send in some questions. So I'm going to uh, try to get through as many of these as we can. As I know we only got you for a little while. Um, first question: um, Socrates the Younger sends in, and he asks, um, flying for two presidents, uh, which president was on time and which president was late all the time? <laughs> <laughs> you know. President Clinton was famous for not actually being on time, you know, he, but, you know, I, I loved all the presidents, but President Clinton was, you know, he, he had a tendency to be slightly delayed and visiting with the people, talking with them, uh, you know, and President Bush was, he was more the military man that he came out of, you know, we were on schedule, on time, you know, he was hanging by the door ready to get off when we blocked in, so, you know, President Clinton uh, still was very effective, but, you know, there was quite a few times where we may not have arrived, uh, or we've arrived on time. Time, but he may not have uh, <laughs> may not have come out of the motorcade on time. Gotcha. Understood. Um, next question from uh, Ath Athena uh, four three five asks: um, How long does the uh, typical pilot serve? Is sixteen years the normal length? You know, normally a pilot at Air Force One, uh, in back in days gone by, once you got hired by the unit, Air Force One, you'd stay with it until you're ready to retire. And if you didn't become the presidential pilot in charge, then you normally do 20 years typical retirement, then retire out of it. In my case, um, I stayed in the Washington, D.C. area. I, my daughter's handicapped, so I was on the exceptional family member program. So I oh, had really? to stay in Washington anyways. Mm -hmm. So I just stayed at Air Force One. I was willing to stay there a full 20 years with no problem. Sure. Just that as I started to move up, uh, it became uh, more advantageous for me to continue on and try to be the presidential pilot. But the normal routine is uh, with every new president, you'll try to have a new presidential pilot. So when President Bush retired, I retired. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Colonel Scott Turner became uh, President Obama's pilot at that point, my deputy. Mm -hmm. um, Golf Guy 412 asks, um, how accurate is the Air Force One movie with Harrison Ford? <laughs> you know, we, back in... We got a lot of these. <laughs> back in President Clinton's administration, we did uh, a lot of uh, work with... Uh, you know the the movie Air Force One. We you know we never pro they provided us a script, but we never really did anything to support it. But uh, when President Clinton went to Jackson Hole, uh, I can't remember what year it was. In one of the summers, uh, Harrison Ford was out there, and he he had a chance to talk with us. Harrison Ford went over to see the big 747 really? and take a look at it. So then you know a year later, the Air Force One doc or the Air Force One movie came out. Right. And, uh, you know, we got to see it. We, President Clinton got to see it on the flight out to Los Angeles, and we all saw it. And, and then they had the crew in to see the movie. It was an incredible movie. Uh, but I the, enjoyed it. Yeah, the movie, the movie is a movie. I mean, they had another 747 made up to look just like Air Force One. Sure. The interior on Air Force One, uh, the movie, you know, the conference room is relatively close. The radio operator area is relatively close. But the rest of the plane with the, you know, the 7-Eleven type coolers in the basement and the winding stairs that's that's not accurate yeah the, when they were downstairs fighting i said uh, you can't fight down there it's nah, it's, it's pretty it's tight. very cramped yeah, it's cramped and the real 747 the air force one i mean there is every spot has a, a you know a requirement and there's just lead between luggage and spare parts etc so. sure exactly um uh staff sergeant mike he sends in he asks he asked, "Why did you? Uh, why did you choose to choose to retire after the um, uh, the Bush administration? Why not stay on for Obama?" The uh, you know actually I, I didn't have a choice. I was at the thirty year point and I was a colonel. 
President Bush had promoted me to general. However, it, really? wasn't, it wasn't approved by the Senate Armed Services Committee. So I pretty much at that point had to to basically retire at that point, which was fine. I, I was honored to have served President Bush. And it's the kind of the credo amongst Air Force One. You know, I mean, it was time for my deputy to be President Obama's pilot. Mm -hmm. Didn't it wasn't you know, it wasn't right for me to continue on at that point there. Yeah, you know, it just it, it other people need to do it. So at that point, I went ahead and retired uh, and and became a civilian, which, uh, you know, is kind of a challenge in itself after you've Not been sure. in the military <laughs> quite that long. But. A military transition is, uh, is never easy. I can only imagine what it's like to go no, from that, that kind of tough. job. <laughs> Um, and uh, last uh, last question from uh, Annie. She asks, uh, when you're flying an airplane, before uh, when you go down the runway, do you know the plane's going to take off? You, you're you trained to, uh, if anything happens before you get at a certain point, uh, before you take off, you're trained to, to stop the aircraft on the runway. Or if you go past that point, then you're trained to, to take it in the air. So, you know, the, I never worried about the plane not performing because we have the best maintainers in the world. Absolutely. But you're always ready for something if it does occur. If you lose an engine, the plane hiccups or whatever, you have a go no go point on the runway. And uh, prior to the go no go point, you're actually going to no go. You're going <laughs> to stop. But after that, you're going to take it airborne and bring it right back around and land as soon as you can. Sure. Uh, tell us about the uh, tell us about the luxuries that commercial airliners have. I know a lot of you, if you're all out there flying, you probably don't believe that what you do is very luxurious. But uh, uh, you you'll probably be surprised by this answer. Uh, uh, commercial airliners do have some luxuries that you, as the pilot Air Force One, you actually don't have. You know, the, the, the airline folks are, are incredible. You know, the highly trained crew, et cetera. But the, the airliners, you know, they have, a, they have a lot of capability on, on the airlines, you know. And the, sure. at Air Force One, you know, we had, it was a standard 747, 14 hours of flying usually you could do, but it was air refuelable, so you could go even longer. But the airline pilots have the advantage of uh, if something goes wrong, they can divert. They can move to another location if the weather's bad, et cetera. You don't have that luxury at Air Force One. You're not going to introduce the president into a new city or a new state or a new country um, unannounced unannounced because you, you know secret service has to get involved you got to move the equipment you got to secure the area or road it, you know so you know you're constantly thinking about where you're going to bring that plane if the weather starts going down or, or whatever sure. but we've got tremendous weather folks that support us so, you know they can give you the the right way to get in and out of areas but the airliners save us day after day because they're constantly moving so they can tell us where the turbulence is at where the weather's at and they're talking to us the whole time. So they are talking to you. Yeah, they can, you know, if we have a question of the controller and an airliner has the answer, the air, you know, hey, what's the best route to get into this area? The airliner is coming up saying, hey, Air Force One, you know, we just descended through some turbulence going through 13, 15,000 feet or whatever. And, you know, it gives us a good information that uh, you know, they're always taking care of us. And we, and we you know, unfortunately, we tie up a lot of airports uh, just because you're sure. bringing the president in. But, you know, we try our best to make sure that the airliners are not, uh, you know, delayed in any sense. We, you know, they got a demanding mission. They got to get yeah. folks to where they got to go. And uh, they've got 200 folks in the back that are, you know, not happy when they don't get there on time. No, that's, uh, that's very true. But uh, for a large 747, you say it can carry over 100, 200 people. But uh, you're actually, uh, you're capped at the number of people you can have on the plane when you're flying. Uh, what's what's the number, if you can give that to us? No, absolutely. There's It's usually 69 to 70 people seat, you know, seats, and then plus the first family. So, you know, a plane that holds 300 plus, that doesn't happen on Air Force One. It's a, sure. it's a the interior is, uh, you know, it's business casual. So it's designed to be a flying White House. It's not mm -hmm. designed to be a luxurious mansion. So it's, you know, there's leather seats for the personnel, but they're not lay flat. You know, they're just, they're designed to be working. And that's what the yeah. staff's doing the entire time they're flying. They're, Absolutely. They're doing the business of the government. So it's, uh, you know, it's you're, you're not taking it so that you're going to have a first class adventure. No. You will have a first class adventure with food and the other things and the support. But, you know, you're not it's not like laying flat on the United <laughs> Airlines or whatever. So. Sure. Sure. Uh, how, how is the food on Air Force One? For me, it's incredible. I mean, the flight attendants <laughs> from the uh, United States Air Force, so they've all been trained. You know, under President Bush, we did a lot of Tex-Mex, pizza, Chinese food. Those are, you know, foods that I love. Uh, I'm uh, not so the foo-foo kind of food. Somebody give me a napkin. My mouth's watering. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, these are these are folks that uh, put your food on a tray and, uh, you know, on the Air Force One uh, 
the, basically the silverware and everything is all set up to be luxurious looking. But it's, it's just a tradition that you're being fed. You're being fed first class food, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not a, a foo-foo kind of setup. It's a, it's a setup designed for people that are working in an environment that, you know, they need this type of food when they're flying. They need a sandwich. They need this and that. But uh, first class capability by all the flight attendants. An incredible group of folks. Hardest working folks I've ever met. That, that indeed they are. Well, uh, Colonel, unfortunately, uh, we're, our time with you has uh, run out. I thank you so much for uh, well, taking time you. to do this. I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope all of you enjoy enjoyed it here and uh, our thanks to the crew who helped uh, make all this possible um, we will be having more guests in the future so by all means go to constitutevoice.com and uh, check us out we'll be making further announcements of guests in the future and remember the convo promotes free thought radical honesty and common sense i thank all of you for joining me i'm eric barnard i'll see you next time